Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff and Alison McConnell are here with me. Hopefully you are safe and well on this Monday, the 8th of June. Boy, is time flying. I'm not even sure, Ruffy, if it's 8, 9, 10, 11 or 12 weeks in lockdown now. It's been that long. No, I think we're all into a routine now. I think uh, when it obviously all gets a lot, lot better, we'll, we'll have to find a, a new life for ourselves because we're all rigid pattern now. So, no, the sooner it comes, the better. Uh, and I think we all can start enjoying ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Here, here, Ruffy. Let's have an end-of-season party, Ali. Uh, I don't care <laughs> when it is, just let's have one. Um, anyway, who knows when that will be, although uh, some, some people have decided <laughs> to hell with lockdown. We'll just march by the thousands, all within about two inches of each other. But that's another matter. Anyway, apart from anything else, Alison and Ruffy are here with us. Hi to Gareth McNaughton, who's a big Hibs and Liverpool fan from Musselburgh. Gareth, Great to have you with us. Uh, Jimmy Wright got married, Ruffy, on the same day you played against Argentina in 1979. So he had a special day, uh, just as you did as well. John McShane's watching us out in Australia. Uh, Lynn Sutherland. Here's another one, Ali. You'll enjoy this. Uh, Ruffy, do you remember Lynn Sutherland? No, where from? <laughs> School. Uh, she saw <clears throat> no. She saw you in 1978, coming out of a pre-season friendly between Partick Thistle and Bucky. You were wearing a black leather coat and you had a pair of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't deny that. You know, uh, I think you had one as well. The the Gestapo leather coat that went <laughs> went down <laughs> your ankles. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, I it didn't have any, trend then. Just, 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 just to clarify, it didn't have the, geese, yeah. the Gestapo memory. No, 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 no. No, no, that's fine. Uh, hi to Joe Keegan, who uh, sent a lovely message saying he enjoys the show. And Jim Ross just wanted to say, Ruffy, on the day that you showed on Friday your letter to be called up to the Scotland squad um, was also the first day that Kenny Douglas would have got a similar letter. Yeah, that's right. The two of us uh, were introduced uh, together. I think Kenny got a game. I didn't get a game. Uh, but no, that was uh, that's what I keep talking about the the promotion of uh, the Scotland under twenty three team a wee back then. I know it's under twenty one now, but the the, the transition for under twenty three into the full squad, there was more and more of us doing it in bulk. Like I've told you, there was five of us all came up from the under twenty three team. There was me, Kenny, Joe Jordan. Gordon McQueen, Frankie Gray come up through that team, Andy Gray come up through that team. So it just shows you that, that there is a gap in the age from a jump from 21 into a full squad. And there's not many of the modern day ones tend to make it. Maybe they're not getting enough games. I don't know what it is, but uh, it seems to be a lot more difficult now to jump uh, up into the full squad. Yeah, hi to John Aird, hi to uh, John Donald as well. There's lots of people joining us. Niall Kane as well. Stephen Martin, Stephen Smith from Cardonald. Yep, uh, as far away as Cardonald is following us as well, Alison. So that's good news for you. Darren Hope and uh, we also got Bim McSkimming, Willie Gibson, Joe Parker, uh, Don Clark, Andy Dunnake, uh, Patrick Glacken is in Bulgaria. Uh, wow, uh, that just we haven't had Bulgaria before, Alison. I don't know about you. I can't think. Have you been to Bulgaria, Alison? There's a question. <clears throat> I have not been to Bulgaria. I think the closest I've got to Bulgaria is interviewing Stylian Petro. Yes, there you are. Um, Bulgaria, Ruffy, uh, it's a lovely place, Bulgaria. Have you been? Uh, only to play Bulgaria uh, in a friendly, I think it was. Yeah, it was a lovely. The weather was fantastic over there. I can remember lots of sort of a. Oh, statues and museums and everything. Yeah, it was a yeah. beautiful place. Oh, I'm so glad you've narrowed it that down was just to Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, statues and museums. Thanks for that, Ruffy. Um, uh, Peter has said, hey guys, three of you. 
what's happening to Barry? Don't worry about it. It's June. Everybody has a wee break. They need a wee holiday. Uh, it's as simple as that. Hi to David Bain, uh, Thomas Collins. There's uh, a few people, actually. Uh, Vladdy Vostok, John Harren. Great to have you with us, John. That's absolutely magnificent. And Stephen Martin says, it is tropical here in Airdrie at the moment. Um, well, there's an interesting one as well. So thanks to so many people who are joining us uh, and, of course, uh, putting lovely messages about their favourite team. We've got lots to talk about. We've got reconstruction, no surprise. Um, and also we'll have the transfer speculation. Our one-to-one -one is with Ian Durant and Ruffy, dare I say it, the big man. Um, I, I've been complimentary towards you to your dream team that you uh, picked 11 players that you played with, but I think Durant is going to run you close today, Ruffy. He's picked his all-time 11 that he played with. And later on, uh, you'll be able to see it and give us your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the, the quality of the players that uh, he played with at Rangers, particularly in Rangers' uh, transitional period when the, a lot of the top-name foreign players were coming in, he certainly played with a lot of big ones. So I'm sure it'll be a really, really good side. Yeah, um, but Hubert McCartney says, Hi, Peter. Um, uh, I'm in uh, Ballymena. Uh, and I became friends with Ian Durant 40 years ago in Kinning Park. Absolute legend. Lived the dream. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, you're absolutely right. So many people. Uh, Stuart Ramsey is in the West Midlands. Can I have a shout out, says uh, Stuart. Absolutely, Stuart, because we, we are so uh, pleased that so many people are joining us from all over the place. And by the way, the figures are unbelievable. We are battering most television programs' audiences. That's how good it's been across Facebook, YouTube, we are on Periscope, Twitter, at PLZ Soccer, and I can tell you uh, that our podcast is going out every day as well. Hi to Andy McHugh, who's in sunny Tenerife. So with that in mind, uh, dare I say it, um, we've decided to put the podcast out five days a week as well. Alison, reconstruction suddenly from nowhere, out of left field, income Rangers, 14-14-18. Uh, a Celtic B and a Rangers B side in the lower leagues. What do you make of it? I think it's an interesting proposition. Uh, however, I do think it's skewered in favour of Celtic and Rangers. I think the real benefit is to is to the two big clubs. I'm not sure what everyone else gets out of it. Uh, I think it's it's interesting the idea to go and give them a, a taste of competitive football. And I do think that the current setup, the current youth setup, doesn't prepare these players to go and play competitive football. You used to have a reserve league where you could play experienced professionals, first team players that were maybe coming back from injury. Uh, they would get a game and I think it was a bit more competitive. So I think that they've lost that in recent years. I can see why uh, Celtic and Rangers would want to put them in a more competitive environment to prepare them for the rigours of first-team football, but I'm not sure what everyone else would get out of it. I also think we're starting to go around the houses a wee bit with reconstruction just to find a way to get there. Yeah, that's the other thing about it. I mean, one chairman described the whole affair, Ruffy, as tedious. We're now on the 8th of June. We're no further forward. I don't think anybody could pin down, if I asked everybody in the media right now, give me an exact date when they're going to vote on this. Everybody knows the permutations of what yeah. you need to pass it. I'm not quite sure they know when it's going to happen. And then when, if indeed it did get the go-ahead, when it would all be implemented in time. Yeah, I agree with Alison. I think it's muddy in the waters. Uh, I think we should stick to, I think the one that we're all favourable to is 14-10-10-10. Uh, seems the easiest way to do it. Promote two teams. Nobody suffers. Invite Kelty and Brora. You know, and it, it's so simple. I, I just can't get my head around why they don't see it as simple. We all know. We know about the SPFL. We know about the you know, if certain other two teams come in, the relegation situation, the devalue and the money they're getting paid out. But I thought, I just thought in the whole scale of things, that's the easy option. That's the best way out for everybody concerned. Uh, I also agree with Alison. Why would you promote Rangers and Celtic young boys what, to, to bring them through quicker so that they can get into the first team and make their team, Rangers and Celtic, even stronger, you know, against everybody else? They have enough financial backing behind them to blow everybody out the the window. The only the only way I would think I might be agreed to it is no no promotion at all for these teams. You know, the Rangers of the Celtic team. If that's where they are, that's where they are. I think I read somewhere that there would be a promotion up to the championship. 
Uh, I, I would say no, you're in the second division, you're in the second division and that's where you stay. Because right away all the teams, the Elgins, the Matroses, the Forfers, they're not going to have a Rangers and a Celtic Coke team getting jumping them up a division. So that would be the, the hindrance for me. I think they would all dive in at the money. I think the money side it looks really, really good if I was an Elgin, a Montrose or a Forfer. But in light of that, I, I, my main thing would be why, why why help Rangers and Celtic to be stronger than what they are? Yeah, well, listen, let's not be fooled by this. The only reason it's come to the fore is there's an opportunity. There's a window open here and Celtic and Rangers clearly look and think to themselves, we can jimmy ourselves in here and, and make even more money. And uh, and a lot of their fans, 20,000 easily would go and see them away from home if it suited them on a Saturday at three o'clock. So that's the reason behind it. And the only one you're right, Ruffy, uh, Alison and I were talking about it before we come on here. The benefit is to Celtic and Rangers here and, and the spirit is it will develop the youth. It may well get people a chance to play against men, which is a good point, uh, and get themselves, you know, a greater percentage of players with more experience. That's the thing. I, I like what you said, Ruffy. I think they should be staying in the bottom league at that point, and that's where they stay, and they do not get the chance to go up, because there's no doubt about it. It will be all about taking as much money as possible, more money off fans every single week. Not that that's, you know, some people say, well, that's all right, but if lots of fans want to go and follow Celtic and Rangers B teams, then fine. But I think it's to the disadvantage of other clubs. You can give us your thoughts on it as well. Uh, it's live here. Martin Thompson says, I watch the programme live and I listen to the podcast when I walk the dug at six o'clock in the morning. I love the show. Thank you for that, Martin. Um, I don't suppose you could get the dug some earphones as well. You never know. Every listener helps, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, yeah, but 14, 14, 18... Um, is an interesting one, apart from Celtic and Rangers. It would bring in Brora and Kelty as well, Alison. I don't know about you, if I'm going to be absolutely blunt about it, I think what Ruffy's saying and what you've mentioned as well, we're running out of time and, and there's always some dissenter somewhere. If anything, if you looked over the last <coughs> three months and documented it, especially on this programme and any other media outlet you care to mention, if you looked over the last three months, you would be embarrassed at what's been happening. I think we've repeatedly come back to this point of a lack of, of obvious leadership. I think you're right, no one seems to know what direction we're going, what deadlines we have for these votes. We seem to be talking in circles at times. I think uh, we're, in, we're well into June. Uh, we're all ambitious about a start of football, of, of top level football in August. Uh, there's chat about the Championship coming back in October. I think we need a bit of clarity about what's happening. If there is to be reconstruction, it has to be decided quickly rather than this constant chattering about it with different proposals coming from different clubs. If there's an appetite for reconstruction, then it's time to get around the table or around the Zoom call uh, and, and find <laughs> out if, if it's genuine and, and if so, put it to the vote. But I think, yeah, I think the clock is ticking now. Yeah, uh, Alec Kelly, uh, who's a Rangers fan, Alec says, uh, Bayern Munich, Porto, Benfica, Braga, Barcelona, Real Madrid, they all have B teams, they're all allowed promotion relegation from uh, the lower leagues, but they're not allowed promotion to the top league, it would be a great addition to our leagues, um, says Alec on this one, yes, I mean, that is a good point, and, and again, I think while I am telling you it is for the benefit of Celtic and Rangers, it is a good point that Alec makes, Ruffy. Uh, you know, lots of clubs across uh, Europe have B teams, um, but it, it then gets to a situation where they just become <coughs> super clubs and everybody else just has to be resigned to their fate that they are just making up the numbers. Yeah, and I already touched on that earlier. You know, if you let uh, young boys go out there and they're obviously going to progress by playing against better players and more competitive and then they come back into the Rangers team, there won't be a lot of them all, all stay in the first team. But there might be enough, you know, to make them stronger and stronger. And, and the, the teams who want to be, you know, professional and move up the leagues will be hindered. Uh, I'd love to know, Peter, I don't know if you would know or Alison would know the answer to this. As we know, a lot of young players go out and loan for Rangers and Celtic. We, we had two Rangers players at Thistle and a Celtic boy. I, I would think there'd be enough Rangers and Celtic young boys, if you look down the leagues, at getting games. 
you know, in the championship or the first division in the second team? Because they seem to be farming quite a lot of them out there. They're, it, it, when we go and play teams, you notice that he's in loan and he's in loan. And I, I think they must get a fair crack uh, at getting their players out anyway under that uh, circumstances. Yeah, Ruffy, it's a smokescreen. Don't let it fool you. Yeah. It's a smokescreen yeah. for getting B teams into the bottom end and then making money out of it and making a good whack of money because there is absolutely no doubt about it, Alison. You know, there are some days when they get 20, 30,000 watching the B team. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure it would be quite such a draw. And I, I think the novelty might wear off a bit. But I, I think, yeah, I think, you know, if Celtic are playing up at, at Aberdeen or Rangers are playing in Dundee and, and the, the B team's playing in Glasgow, I think there's definitely people that would be inclined to go along and, and take an interest in the players that are up and coming, taking their kids along to see. The, the youth team players it's something to do, but I agree with you. I think it's it's, it's an exercise in, in making money. I think there's an exposure there for, for players, and, and as Ruffy said, there are a number of players from, from from all Premier League sides who go out on loan regularly in order to get first-team football for that very reason, for, to, to play in a competitive environment. I was going to say, Gary McGurn does make a point, though. Yes, Celtic Rangers would make money, but uh, Gary says Scottish football would benefit. More money going around the smaller clubs. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You can't argue that point, Ruffy. I mean, that is a, a point that no, would said, be the case, you know? No, no, I said that. I said that as soon as I read it. I, I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, owners, uh, a chairman of the clubs in the second division going, oh, look, we're going to get X amount up front. We're going to get uh, a guaranteed uh, 200 people coming in. That's going to be paid for. So the financial point of view, it, it has to be a yes. There's no doubt about that. But for every yes, I would say there are more no's. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we've seen the, the lower divisions reacting to being offered money rather than looking at the future of the game. So for me, that would be the, the stumble. That would be the one that they'd go for. They'd sit down and look at all the figures and say, well, how much is this going to add on to our, our budget and, or whatever? But for me, it's the promotion thing that nobody will agree on. Yeah, Jim Crawford says on YouTube, go back to a reserve league like it used to be when you could blood young players. Uh, simple as that. Um, yeah, I mean, there are good points on that as well. Trevor Kane says, Peter, Rangers and Celtic B teams stay in the bottom league. Both teams would take a good support to the lower teams and help them out financially. Yep, uh, uh, Trevor, I don't think we can we can argue this one. It's, it's very much, at, it's not even at the embryonic stage. It's, it's a proposal that I don't think, I just get the sense that I don't think it's going to get off the ground. I may be wrong. Uh, I just don't think reconstruction is happening because we're dragging our heels and a lot of people are talking about the fact that it's just a lack of leadership. There doesn't seem to be a situation where you have one voice saying, look, this is the way forward. I wonder if in the way forward, if we have to somehow detach ourselves and put together what Lachlan Cameron said a good few months ago on this programme, maybe get a commissioner or someone who comes in as the ultimate chief executive and says, look, I have this board here. I will dictate to you. Here's how I'm going to promote and bring money in. And this is the structure. And this is how we do it, Alison. I wonder if that would be better in what I call the fragmented, bickering, petty-mindedness, uh, self-preservation society that we're dealing with at the moment. Yeah, I completely agree. I think even bringing various organisations under one umbrella has, has merit in it. Uh, but I think what we've seen over the last few months is, is a clear lack of decisive action and a clear lack of leadership. And I think now, at this time, as we're all keen to get football back up and running and we're looking at teams coming back for, for, for staggered starts to come into training, I think we need to know where we're going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, lots of people coming. Don't forget to share the stream on Facebook and, of course, uh, on YouTube as well. You can hit the subscribe button. Uh, Gary Ramsey, this is not the show for you. You really don't want to be watching this. You need to go in the gutter somewhere else. Simple as that. Um, lots of positive people talking about their uh, teams and supporting their teams. That's what this show's all about. It's a football show if you want to put your message across on YouTube, Facebook, and, of course, on uh, Twitter at 
PLZ Soccer. You can do. We're on Periscope and the podcast as well. Great to have your company. Ruffy is with me, Alison McConnell. Uh, of course, there's lots of transfer speculation about as well, which is interesting because Rangers have obviously got uh, the young man Bassi from Leicester in already. Uh, and they're possibly looking at a couple of other loan deals that have been mentioned. Ryan Brewster at Liverpool, uh, another one that's been touted. So clearly he's got a strategy, Alison, where he's going to try and get some youth in there to uh, supplement the experience that he already has. I still think he needs to pull out a couple of what I call those classic blue chip signings that puts the fear of God into everyone else over at Ibrox. Absolutely. I think what you've seen over the course of the last season is that they just don't quite have the depth or the, or the quality to match Celtic. Uh, and I think the only way you get that is by bringing in players and players who are experienced and who have already played at the very high level. But that, of course, costs money. I don't know what the, the finances are that are available to Steven Gerrard, but that doesn't come cheaply. Obviously, there are diamonds still to be found in the transfer market. They've done very well with Alfredo Morelos, but they're few and far between. And I think if you're going to try and go toe-to-toe with Celtic this season and and stop this 10th title, then there has to be more investment, I think, into the playing squad. Yeah, don't forget, if you are enjoying yourself, you're feeling a wee bit thirsty, try and put ice in your glass and lots of it, just big chunks, so that when you have a drink, it makes a noise as if someone thinks they've dropped some of the loose change in their bag. I'm just suggesting that to Yali. I don't know where that could possibly have come from, but the good thing about it is... I want you to spare a thought, Alison, for the guy who's walking his dog at six o'clock in the morning, <laughs> listening to the podcast, and then suddenly he hears a big giant chink while you were talking, and his dog absolutely jumps out of its skin. Ruffy, are you okay? Have you have you had enough drinks? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, un- <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah. no. Unfortunately, I have my uh, my my soda and lime on a dining yeah. room table, and I'm, I've. Got, I've been threatened to have a mat under the glass in case it stones the wood, as Alison will tell you. But it just happened so when I lifted the glass, the, the mat fell off. So I'm sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, no, no, no. We always laugh. We always laugh. You always bring us a bit of merriment on it. Uh, mm-hmm. Ruffy, uh, we were talking about the the Rangers transfers, and obviously we'll hear from Ian Durant. He's our one to one today, and there's some good listening to him. He's got a great, uh, I tell you, he's got a great dream team of the best eleven players he's played with. But there's some good points because uh, Durant is part of uh, a group of people who want a pathway towards the professional setup. And I'm talking, of course, about East Kilbride. He's in there with uh, Steve Aitken in there, so he's looking for that, and he's got some interesting points to make on Rangers and the bid to stop ten in a row. Listen, never mind the the Rangers speculation. Uh, there's other clubs who'll be speculating, trying to bring in players. Ruffy, uh, I'm looking here at Celtic transfer talks with Odson Edouard to see if they can get him on a better deal. Fraser Foster, they're talking about ten million. Ruffy from Southampton for the third choice goalkeeper. I mean, Guy's piece for a 32 year old. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, that's the we we keep talking about the the difference in transfer money up here and down there. Uh, Celtic will have to do a lot of negotiating on that one. Uh, I'm sure, obviously, the wages as well will come into it, you know, but it depends how much they really dig in. But I think Celtic are going to have to maybe put, push the boat out a wee bit here. I heard a player being mentioned. They might be interested to, to cut the, the deficit a wee bit. So, no, it's a, it's a really tough one, that one, you know, negotiating-wise, but we know the, the boss at Celtic is very good at that, so I'm sure he has to work a deal. He really does, because obviously Craig Gordon's going to be moving. So, yeah, they'll have to do something. Uh, Alison, slowly but surely, they're just starting to shift out the the, the players that... I, I love this about the big clubs, especially Celtic and Rangers. Uh, you know, they sign with all the fanfare and this is one for the future. This is a kid who's going to set the header on fire and then slowly but surely when they realise that he's just not what they thought they'd signed, Marian Zved looks as if he could be heading back out the door again. So slowly but surely they're starting to empty people who are not going to make a contribution. Shved's an interesting one, isn't he? I thought he actually played pretty well that game he came on for one of the European qualifiers last uh, the end of August, September last year and we've never glimpsed him since. I think there were question marks about who had signed him. I think uh, when Brendan Rodgers was here when he came in there were question marks about whether or not he'd, he'd wanted another winger and where he was going to fit in but 
I don't feel as though, obviously, the manager, Neil Lennon, will see him in, in training every day and he knows uh, his competitor for, for the jersey, but we've seen very little of him to make a judgment on him. Uh, however, it's, it's clear that if he, if he's gone a full season without coming into the team, it's, it's fairly apparent that uh, that he's maybe better off going elsewhere in, in the search of getting some football time. But to go back to your point about, about Foster, I'd be amazed if Celtic sign Fraser Foster on a permanent deal, I think. Their very best chance of keeping him for another season might be going back to a second loan deal. I, I just think the finances involved in it are probably prohibitive when you look at the, the salary that he commands at the minute and probably there would be sufficient interest still from south of the border to, to maybe match those those salary terms. Uh, I think if there is to be a deal done, I think it, it's far more likely that you would see a, another loan deal rather than a permanent signing. I just I, I can't see it being plausible at all. Yeah, I can't see it. 70 grand a week, Rafi. I don't know about you, but <laughs> if I was 70 <laughs> grand a week, I might, I'd still be kissing the Southampton badge right now and saying I'm, I'm yeah. here, even though I'm third choice. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously he's not going to go back there, you know, and, and as Alison said there, if he was to sign for Celtic for another two or three years, you know, you, you're not going to get much money back at the end of that one. So you've got to think of the worth of the whole deal, uh, and certainly that's why I'm saying the negotiations uh, will be very, very interesting because, I mean, bo bo both clubs, I mean, Southampton will say, well, we'll just take them back again. Uh, and then Fraser Foster's left not playing football, so he's going to force it a wee bit, you know. So I think he'll be the one, you know, that obviously have to take a cut. He'll be the, the one that's going to have to say, look, this is what I want to play my football and, and hope somebody comes down in the price that they're asking for. Yeah, um, Kevin McFarlane says, Hibs have got Nisbet from Dunfermline. Done deal, says Kevin. I'll tell you, whoever gets Nisbet, I know Dundee United mm. were sniffing about him as well. And the reason for that, Ali, I know Dundee United were sniffing about him because they're obviously trying to load the bases in case they lose Shanklin over the next two yeah. months. Nisbet surely caught the eye, actually. I think uh, his goal scoring stats last season were, were tremendous. Uh, Shanklin, I think, is an interesting one too. I think... Uh, whether or not Dundee United hang on to him for another season. I think there were question marks about him going up to Tanadise. He hit the ground running. Uh, and I think goal scorers always come at a premium. Clubs are always willing to, to, to pay money to take on a goal scorer. So uh, it's an interesting one. I think Nesbitt's a, a, a good value signing if, if whenever he goes next. Yeah, Niall says, um, you know, can you see Livingston accepting £2 million for Lyndon Dykes? He, he's in demand. I mean, they started to link him to Celtic or Rangers, and uh, and obviously there are other clubs that will be looking at him down south. Uh, big boy, I, I think he offers clubs a different style, Ruffy, from their usual. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if it's, if it's not working, suddenly you can go long to him. He's, he's, a, he's, gonna, he's a big battering ram. Well, that, that, that's on for the first season at Queen of the South. Uh, he was playing uh, off uh, Adobe. Uh, he was doing all his work, you know, and he was very, very impressive. And I was sitting beside uh, one of our directors and I said, look, see if we get a chance. We, we should go for him right now. Uh, and unfortunately, he moved up a few levels uh, the next season. Uh, and he was one. But he has he's one of these ones like Shanklin year on year get better, better, you know, but for me, £2 would be an awful lot of money and I don't think Livingston could turn that down from anybody, but uh, certainly he is, he is a boy for the future and he has got better, as I said. Yeah, I think he's also yeah, well, got, uh, sorry, he's, just, he's also got that bit of gallusness, I think, about him. I think he's, he's not been intimidated playing against Celtic or Rangers. Uh, I think he was a real handful for, for Julian when, when Celtic played through in, in, in Livingston earlier in the season. Uh, and I think you need that. I think if you're going to move up and, and you are linked with the Celtic Rangers or you make the, the move there, I think you need that mentality and that, that bit of self-belief and, and arrogance in your own ability. I think it can go a long way. 
Yeah, Stephen says that he wouldn't get into the Celtic first team, but he might get into the Rangers first team. So that would be the best destination for him. It's not a bad point, actually. And if I was Stephen Gerrard and I had that spare cash, I certainly would go out and buy that type of player. Because as you say, Ali, certainly on the evidence of what I witnessed at uh, the games Livingston against Celtic, he really knew how to put himself about. He was a real handful. And uh, if you get someone who is a good goal scorer, what I call the big striker, we striker, striker, Ruffy, that's the type of player you need mm-hmm. that suddenly can, can free you up. Um, so, uh, what a pity Craig Levine's not still in management, Ruffy. Uh, he would be the perfect buy uh, for Hearts. They'd buy him and then play a wee striker off him, dare I say it. Although I noticed today, <laughs> Ruffy, to get your thoughts on it, I know Craig Levine's been speaking on another broadcast outlet, uh, suggesting that if he was still kept on, Hearts wouldn't be uh, in the predicament that they're in at the moment. I would dare to suggest, no, they wouldn't, because we wouldn't be talking about reconstruction, because if Craig was still there, they'd be relegated. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I think, obviously, he has his own beliefs, but I think we've all seen what's happened to Hearts in the last couple of years. We've seen the influx of players coming in and going, and they are not a patch of the team that we all used to rave about, uh, particularly at Tyne Castle. So, no, I think he's got a few things to answer for. And I think if he's honest enough with himself, which I'm sure he will at some stage, uh, he will see that there are a lot of mistakes that he made. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt about that. It'll be interesting to see uh, when we eventually get back to training. Uh, in- interestingly enough, here are the uh, details of getting back to training in Scotland. This is the type of thing that everybody is going to have to adhere to uh, with regards to the training. Uh, you've got to return in staggered time slots to complete COVID-19 questionnaires before you take your training sessions, undergo contactless temperature checks, Um must wash your own training kit. Well, that was something that Ruffy would have been able to do anyway if his mum and dad were there. Uh, refrain from spitting or chewing gum. <laughs> okay. Uh, maintain high levels of cleanliness and hygiene at home and in the car. Travel to and from training individually. Go through pre-training screening area and use sanitation stations. Um, PPE must be worn by medical staff. COVID-19 tests carried out twice weekly. Now... It all sounds as if that's a, a, a healthy list there to adhere to, but uh, Dave Cormack has suggested that it could cost them something like £100,000 all the way through to the end of this year, uh, and he reckons that Aberdeen are losing a million a month. So it's a hefty bill that, that's gathering pace here, Alison. Yeah, it certainly is, and, and when you... I suppose that the real issue we all have is you have no idea for how long you're going to have to do this and you're going to have to pay for testing. No one can come out and say, well, it's a short-term measure because a vaccine will be widely available in, in January or February because obviously we don't know. So when you're talking about the amounts, it, it, I think part of the problem is that you, you don't know. You can't foresee just how long that's going to have to be budgeted into your finances for. Uh, the fact that they're losing so much money per month at the minute, I'm sure, is a factor too. I think when you're hemorrhaging that amount of money, it cannot possibly go on in the long term. It's just it's not sustainable. Take it you and Craig Levine don't see eye to eye, Peter. Uh, yes, we do see eye to eye. I mean, I, I think he, he was fantastic in press conferences last season. But listen, this is a program where you, you get to call it exactly the way you see it. You'll get an opinion on here. We might like a bit of banter, but you'll get an opinion, Ruffy. When I watched Hearts regularly last season, they were ranked rotten. I mean, I do not know how anybody shelled out a season ticket to watch Craig Levine's side. They were murder. The only yeah. thing that made me happy every time I was at Tynecastle was seeing Stephen A. Smith's name on the starting team because then I thought, oh, we'll get a wee bit something mm-hmm. different because he's a he's a player. But the rest of it was turgid. Yeah, as I said earlier there, I think Craig Levine has to hold his hand up and say that the, the latter years of his stint at Hearts were poor. But, I mean, I, I think, I can't remember who it was that said, let's not forget, you know, his playing days, let's not forget, you know, what he did in the glory days and... I think you shouldn't you shouldn't forget that you know, but it doesn't mean that you can't you know forget the last two years. You know you've got to think of it all. But I still think he is a club legend. I would like to think that uh, the supporters will think of him very very highly uh, and move on. As you you keep saying, 
time as a good healer. And obviously, the last two years were very, very poor. But I think in the whole, if you added up all the years he was at Hearts, I think he would he would be positive in what he's done for Hearts. Yeah. Time is a time is a great healer, Ali, and um, you know we've mentioned it continually when we're talking about Brendan Rodgers, who obviously uh, has been just slowly but surely uh, drip drip feeding little nuggets about his time at Celtic and how he was told to let Scott Brown go and and how he held on to him and things like that. I mean, it's uh, if ever you're wanting. <laughs> Just the positive stories to keep going until eventually he's welcome back. Um, I'm witnessing it over the last few weeks. I don't know how you feel about that, Alison. I think it's impossible to airbrush him out of the club's history and and what he done. I think the way he left has left a, a, a sour taste for, for many people. Uh, I think uh, it's quite clear. I told you a few weeks ago, I, I wrote a column suggesting that maybe it was time to you know, appreciate what he'd done for the club and it met with a, a fairly vitriolic response. So if you're going to dip a toe into the waters, it's still fairly nuclear. Uh, my own personal feeling would be that uh, he had been looking to leave uh, and the signs were there for, for the previous year that uh, that he, his time was coming to an end. Uh, I think, you know, he, he was good for Celtic and Celtic was good for Brendan. And I think it, at some point you have to acknowledge the, the treble treble and the invincible season uh, and, and the part that you had to play in it. Yeah, absolutely. Just out of curiosity, Ruffy, I mean, I, I wonder, I was just talking there about that list that went up there for the clubs to uh, pay attention to and obviously follow the rules with regards to testing. I, I, I wonder if the Championship League 1 and League 2 will ever get started this season. Uh, I think it'll be very difficult under these rules. I think the championship uh, will have a the championship will have a good chance of doing it because most of the clubs are, are full time, uh, and, and I think obviously they have a a, a schedule that they, they they do day to day. I think the part time clubs will have a difficult one with the, the most of their their staff being out working all day and mixing with people and coming into the stadium and a lot of the things that were up there will be very difficult to, to uphold. But I, I think the, the most difficult thing the players will have is getting out of that routine because a lot of players travel uh, together. You know, four and five of them all jump in a car if they're living in Stirling or whatever, and they all travel to the games together. They all leave and they go out for a coffee together. The, you know, it's just a, a routine that they're in. And, and the dressing room scenario will be a, a difficult one as well. You know, no showers. You have to just... Leave, so it's going to be really, really difficult for a lot of them mentally to get round what they've got to do. Peter Head boys, uh, you know, half of the team used to all go up in a minibus or cars from yeah. Bells Hill, um, so yeah. that's just a non starter right away. Um, and if it isn't, and they all go up in individual cars, it's, uh, it's a long, lonely road, let me tell you. Um, lots of other things I want to get your points on, guys. By all means, uh, hi to. Uh, lots of people who are joining us, uh, George Mullen, as ever, Stephen Hill, uh, James Dunn, uh, Doogie Little, always with us, uh, Pat Burns. Uh, there's lots of people who uh, are joining us and offering us their opinion on the programme, not only on Facebook, but of course on YouTube as well. Lots of very good points uh, that are being uh, made across the board, uh, although interestingly enough, uh, uh, Kevin McFarlane says, uh, I noticed Camberry has arrived back in Scotland uh, on Sunday there. A lot Borna Barisic, I think, <coughs> came back in to try and beat the 14-day quarantine. Um, I wonder if he'll be back at Hibs, says Kevin McFarlane. He may well go back to Hibs for training, Ruffy, but he'll have to do it in a long yeah. pink dress with a blue rinse wig yeah. and possibly a moustache. <laughs> yeah, uh, I believe he's in quarantine for the next fortnight up in the Shetland Isles. So <laughs> it, depends. it depends when, when he tries to brave it to come down to Edinburgh. <laughs> I cannot. I mean, honestly, there are some footballers you actually think, really, really. I mean, you should. Ju it's just not, uh, not the thing to do. Ali is tell people that you're absolutely loving Rangers yeah. when you're when you're a signed Hibs player. It just not that. Not yeah. that saying loving Rangers is a bad thing. It's just you don't do it when you're signed with Hibs and you need to go back there at some point. 
think the word we use here is myopic. Uh, yeah, I think the <laughs> failure to see what was coming six months down the line is, uh, is, is maybe something that he's had ample time to think about during lockdown. Yeah, uh, March some 66, Ruffy uh, on YouTube has said, wow, I'm absolutely shocked, Peter. I didn't know people in Bells Hill had motors. So, uh, yeah, just another dig at people from Lanarkshire, <laughs> Ruffy. We've got to, ta got to take it in the chin. It's as simple as that. Um, we do have motors, I have to say to you, Mark, some, we get them from people in other areas. Simple as that. <laughs> Like Clarkson in Knightswood, <laughs> where Ruffy was brought up. Uh, anyway, apart from that, uh, Ruffy, what did you make a manager of the year? Scottish football writers, they've given it to Neil Lennon, and John McGinn got uh, Scotland International Player of the Year. Yeah, I think in our debate uh, last week, I think uh, Neil Lennon was a shout. Uh, it was a shout for me anyway. You know, I go under the principle that it uh, doesn't matter about budgets, you know, the pressure's still on you when you've got all the money in the world, you've still got to win. Uh, trophies and certainly that's what Neil's done uh, and, and I think uh, that's why I went for him. Uh, I know Gary Holt and all the other boys had credentials uh, for, for being mentioned and nominated which was great. I think the other three were absolutely superb but for me Lenny was the, the winner outright. Yeah, um, no argument with that. Ali as Ruffy's fridge goes on. No, uh, I Voted for Lennon too. Uh, I think if you're if you're uh, if you're if you're winning and showing the kind of consistency that his team did, then I, I think you're a worthy winner. I think had the, the, the coronavirus not interrupted things, then I think they might have been looking at a quadruple treble. And I, I don't think you can overstate just how difficult it is to keep that going. Yeah, uh, George Downey says on Peter's point about watching Hearts. Uh, uh, doesn't know how anyone could buy a season ticket, Peter. That's part and parcel, uh, uh, parcel of uh, watching football. You take the good with the bad, George. Uh, I know you're a Hearts fan. You're absolutely right, 100% right. You know, fans pay their money. They pay for season tickets. You watch your team if they're rotten. You watch your team. I absolutely get that. It's only my, it's only my observation on Craig Levine's tenure as manager. I just thought, uh, you know, as I've said on several occasions, I thought, and stuck with him too long should have sacked him earlier and then should have just got him out of the building completely um, because there were so many mistakes made, including, I think, the, the Stendhal situation as well, which dragged on and suddenly Hearts now find themselves in, in an unbelievable situation. Although I noticed Hearts Football Club on their Twitter, uh, Ruffy, uh, and I think maybe on their Facebook as well, they're doing a, a feature called The Daily Robbo, where they show a goal from John Robertson. Now, that could go on for hundreds of weeks because the wee man scored goals for fun. But I'm wondering if they're just giving a Daily Robbo just as a wee reminder, just to tease people that he, that he might come <laughs> back at some point. Well, if, if it does come up for grabs, he'll certainly be a contender. There's no doubt about that. You know, I think the momentum that he's done uh, in Renes and obviously the memories of the supporters have of him. It wouldn't be a negative appointment. Uh, I don't think, I think the supporters would buy into it, no problem whatsoever. So we'll have to wait and see when that, that time comes, whether uh, uh, he's going to be up there. So it'll be interesting to see. There'll be a lot of people uh, if obviously the manager decides to walk away or Hearts don't offer him a new contract. There'll be an awful lot of managers out of a job. So it'll be interesting to see who they all are. I was just going to say to you there, Alison, Peter McQuaid says, Alison, the Scottish Cup has still to come. The quadruple treble is still on. I'm, I'm just wondering when the Scottish Cup is going to come, Ali, because the suggestion is that they're going to hold off as long as possible till they get fans in to watch the semi-finals and the final of this cup whenever they try and play it. I'm not sh I just don't know when that would happen. Yeah, there, there's been chat about having it played at some point when the new season kicks off, playing both semi-finals and then obviously playing the final. But I can't see there being fans involved or, or, or allowed into stadiums anytime soon. I think I'd be amazed if it happened before the turn of the year. And I think if you're wanting to play the games and and play these showcase games, then you would want to you would want them to be played in front of in front of supporters. I think. Uh, However, if it was a choice between them not being played at all, then I think obviously you would take the behind closed doors element if, if it was there. But I think ideally you'd want them played in front of supporters. 
Yeah, absolutely. Don't forget to like, share and follow us on Facebook. You can uh, share our stream to your friends, let them know we're here talking about football, keeping you up to date with what's happening on a daily basis, giving you your fix of football throughout the summer as well. We plan to the best of our ability to be here with you. And of course, uh, we're on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Periscope. Twitter and uh, the podcast going out every day now. You can get it on, uh, of course, Spotify and Deezer. Ruffy, I know every platform that's going by the way, I've had to get every one of them <laughs> just to keep, I, I'm like a constant book of what's happening on social media, but you can get us on there. You can join us every day. We've got different panellists, special guests as well. We're only seconds away from hearing from uh, Ian Gerrant and then I'll get the thoughts of Ali uh, and Alan on his dream team. Um, but uh, the other thing I was going to just quickly get your thoughts on, guys, and I noticed that Simon Jordan, uh, the former Crystal Palace chairman, had mentioned it on TalkSport. It was an interesting one. He said, you know, salary capping it has got to be the way ahead in football. I don't see that being introduced, Ruffy, in, a, in an economy where people have to earn their living. And, and you cannot, I think implement a salary cap situation, whether it's the millions and billions of the Premier League or anywhere else in life? I think it's went too far now, Peter. I think uh, the game itself and the players and their agents uh, know what the going rate is. Uh, they know that uh, what other people are getting and that's always been the problem. You know, if somebody else is getting more than what they're getting, that's, that's when the club gets stung. So, no, I think it's the money has got so far out of hand, it's, it's unreal. I don't think you'll be able ever to drop back in again. You know, you won't get these massive big players who are getting 200,000 a week to say, right, all of a sudden you're only getting 100. They'll be so used to getting that 200, then uh, they'll just move about. They'll just do what they always do. If, they, if there's a chance of getting more money somewhere else, they'll, they'll go and get it. So it'll be a tough one to implement. Yeah, but the, the reason why I don't see it uh, being implemented, Ali, if anything, the one thing that I think has got out of hand is the money that's changing hands in transfer fees, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I don't think you can begrudge the players because if there's a demand, it's, it's pure business economics here. If there's a demand for certain players who play at certain clubs, then they, they get their money. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I think the horse is bolted. I don't think you're ever going to be able to introduce a salary cap now. Uh, and I agree, you're always going to have clubs willing to pay it. You're always going to have uh, clubs clamouring to bring in the very elite talent to, to take them one step further, be that in the Champions League or, or be it in a domestic sense. Uh, I, and I also think that the power that the players have now, I, I think it's very difficult to dilute that. Yeah, um, listen, great to have your company with us on the programme. We love that you stick with us. We always try and bring you a special guest, uh, someone that uh, has played football at the very highest level, uh, all the way down to someone who's played football for the absolute love of the game. Uh, we love our football on this show, and earlier today I caught up with a Rangers legend. Well, I'm delighted to say our special guest on the football show is former Rangers midfielder Ian Durant. Ian, delighted that you are safe and well. I know you're safe and well because you're, you're getting a wee bit of golf in as well. So clearly everything A-OK -okay with you. Uh, the good thing is you're back in football. What does it feel like being back there with the East Coast Bride? Delighted. Uh, I've, I've been at a few games over the last few years. I've obviously known James and Paul, the owners of the club. And uh, just great, now, along with Stevie. And Chris's brother would be going to have the opportunity now to go back in again and, and a now up and coming and a highly successful club. Yeah, is the ambition there? Do you sense that they've really got the drive? They want to be the professional club in the setup in Scotland. Well, what what you what they've got just now, Peter, you could go ahead with now up at K Park, but the the planning permissions are in for the new stadium, which will hopefully get the go ahead in the next two or three months. The ambition of, of James and Paul and, and the, the committee at East Kilbride now, the, the funding they do, it's is just second to none. I said, now, we could go just now with what we've got, but they want to improve and make sure now we can go and try and push up the leagues. And of course, you are back in tow with Stevie Aiken. What is it that's special about him that keeps the two of you together? A good cop, bad cop situation. I think well, I've been labelled a bad cop, but it, just, it was good to work now. Uh, 